I invested in that first bubble of 1968 and managed to make a small fortune and lose it. And after that, I became a, a completely die-hard value manager. We didn't lose money in 2000. We didn't lose money in 2001. And we did not, by the skin of our teeth, lose money in 2002. So by the time the S&P was down 50%, we had had three up years. I think of myself as a realist, trying to see the world as it really is and not the way I'd like it to be. Throughout his five plus decades managing money, Jeremy Grantham has earned a reputation as a bit of a doomsday oracle. The billionaire co-founder of GMO has become famous for predicting financial disaster, most notably by identifying investing bubbles before they pop. Like the dot-com crash in 2000, the financial crisis in 2008, and the tech bubble in 2021. Once in a blue moon every 20 years or so, you'll hit an inflection point that people stop thinking about fundamentals and they just start worrying about how much the stock is going up and are they missing it. Grantham says this over-enthusiasm for bullishness is simply part of human nature. I always like to say there's nothing more supremely irritating than watching your neighbors get rich. It is just irresistible to try and join in. And now, Grantham is confident about how things will play out next. We will have a recession are running perhaps deep into next year and an accompanying decline in stock prices. These days, the legendary British-born investor spends the majority of his time concerned with a looming catastrophe he deems far more important than the great market bubbles, the climate crisis. I think we've made our planet unfavorable to life in every form, including Homo sapiens. You are well known in the investment world for uh, saying that sometimes there are bubbles and bubbles should be avoided. Do you think we're in a major bubble now, at, right now in the United States? And do you think that uh, the tech bubble has burst sufficiently so, so that the tech bubble burst is over? I think we are descending from the 2021 bubble, which was one of the great bubbles. And this should be normally the deflationary pe period, the deflating period, uh, which is a function of... Uh, Will the earnings uh, decline? Will profit margins decline? Will the economy go into recession? And we will have a recession uh, running perhaps deep into next year and, uh, and an accompanying decline in stock prices. So the recession that you're predicting is probably not going to happen in 2023, but it maybe... It may start in 2023. Uh, the Federal Reserve recently said that they think we've uh, kind of uh, cleared the recession uh, hurdle, and they don't really project a recession any longer. Right. You disagree with the Fed on that? Yeah, I think the Fed's record on these things is, is wonderful. It's uh, almost guaranteed to be wrong. They uh, have never called a, a recession, and particularly not the ones following the great bubbles. They prided themselves in, in stimulating the bubbles. They took credit for the beneficial effect of, of higher asset prices on the economy. They have never claimed credit for the deflationary effect of asset prices breaking, and they always do. Now, you said uh, not too long ago that you weren't a big fan of uh, Jay Powell and the way he's been handling inflation. Uh, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And you think he's done a better job recently in getting inflation under control? I think um, it's largely out of his hands. The forces work. I suspect inflation will never be as low as it averaged for the last 10 years that we have re-entered a period of, of moderately higher inflation and therefore moderately higher interest rates. In the end, life is simple. Low rates push up asset prices, higher rates push asset prices down. And we're now in an era that will average higher rates than we had for the last 10 years. So today, uh, you would say we're likely to go into a recession probably next year, though it could start this year, that the uh, tech bubble burst that we saw beginning, let's say, last year has not yet completely played itself out. Right. And we have a little mini bubble a bit in artificial intelligence. In a way, not so many. Uh, they were very big moves in a dozen very big stocks. And um, well, many, were, in, many in the sense that it's not affecting the overall economy as much as the whole tech. No, no, that's right. In, in comparison to 2021 and, and 1929, it's 
It's so much so what is it about human nature that makes them feel they want to participate in a bubble? They see the stock market going up and they think they're going to miss something. Even the famous Sir Isaac Newton participated in a bubble. Yes, he did. When he thought he was missing something, he mortgaged his house and put all of his money into the South Sea Corporation and lost all of his money. So even somebody as smart as that is unable to resist the bubble. Why is it that humans can't resist being in bubbles? I always like to say there's nothing more supremely irritating than watching your neighbors get rich. It is just irresistible to try and join in. And uh, when enough people hit the inflection point, it sucks in everybody. And they're, they're the great bubbles. They're the ones that are interesting. Mostly there's a nice balance between bulls and bears. And once in a blue moon, every 20 years or so, you'll hit an inflection point where enough people become bullish that people stop thinking about fundamentals. Now, we're in Boston, and you've lived much of your professional career here, but I can tell from your accent you're not from Boston originally. So where are you originally from? Well, I was born in Hertfordshire, just south of London. And then when the war broke out, my father volunteered, and the family moved up to stay with our grandparents in the north of England in a coal mining town called Doncaster. And, uh, and then eventually I got lucky and got into have a business school and came over here. Before we get there, what did your father do? Was he uh... He was a, a surveyor. Uh, he built in England, he was building bridges and air, airports and so on. So you went to college in England, is that right? Yes. And what did you study? I studied economics. And you said, okay, now I know economics, I'm ready to go to Harvard Business School. What propelled you to go across the ocean to go to Harvard Business School? Well, actually, I applied for a job in a, in a consulting firm uh, dominated by Oxford and Cambridge upper-class gentlemen. And uh, the interview was so insulting. Um, he said, come back and see me when you've had you know, 35 years of variegated experience or you've been to the Harvard Business School. So I walked out, I stood on the sidewalk, wondering whether I should burn the building down or apply to Harvard Business School. So I did the latter. So how did you do at Harvard Business School? I think um, I was the classic bottom of the top third. Okay, so as the bottom of the top third, did you decide to stay in Boston, go back to England? What did you decide to do? I uh, decided to do what so many of us did, get a job in consulting, management consulting, and use that time to see what was cooking. Actually, it took me the lunch on the first day uh, to realize that consulting was not for me. All right, so you went to work for Keystone. Yes. And then you left there after how many years? I left there after nine months. Nine months? I propositioned my boss, uh, Dean LeBaron, to, uh, that we might start a new firm on our own. And the name of that firm was? Battery March. So you were one of the co-founders of Battery March? Yes, there were, in those days, two of us. And that firm became well-known in the 1960s and 70s for its uh, emphasis on what? Um, well, it was a value shop by today's standards. And, uh, and we owned small stocks as well. And small stocks were not fashionable. It was the Nifty 50 era where everyone owned Avon and Exxon, and that was it. Uh, so it was very unfashionable to own cheap, small companies. And of course, they were much, much cheaper. And uh, in the long run, that means you do better. And uh, we had a hard job selling the idea to a, a world whose idea of heaven was IBM and Coca-Cola. But eventually, we made some penetration. Now, did you invent then or develop an uh, index fund? Yes. I have was that to say, novel at the time? It, it was completely novel in my mind. I was not aware that at the same time uh, Wells Fargo was working on it far away and rather quietly. So you built an index fund and how did that go? Very, very slowly for the first two years. Someone gave us a, an award for the most talked about product with no business. And then eventually we picked up a Bell system. And then you decided to start your own firm? Yes. So GMO is now a very large asset management firm. And uh, did you make your reputation here for predicting bubbles? No, I, I think we specialized in value management. Right. And, uh, 
and, and beating the benchmark. Uh, Dick Mayo and I happily won the first nine years in a row, which is a good way to start a firm at GMO, uh, doing US traditional stock picking value, and we won by an average of eight points a year. Well, that produced a lot more money coming in, I assume. That and took care of, of our problems for a long time. But when did you become so well known for predicting bubbles or thinking that the markets were out of kilter sometimes? Was that because of your writings or because of your stock picking or your public speeches? Um, I started writing quarterly letters in 98. And 98, 99, of course, was a glorious, uh, a glorious bubble. And it just went up and up and up and up. And uh, we fought the bubble uh, all the way. So we were horrifically too early. That was a brutal two years. And the earnings were rising as well. So the market made a magnificent move from its all-time high in early 98. Went straight up until March of 2000. And, uh, and our clients did not approve of us being early. and. Uh, to a very considerable degree, fired us. So people pulled money out, and then when the market finally did have its collapse, the so-called dot-com bubble burst, did people call you up and say, we're sorry, can we give you our money now? Not a single solitary person who fired us uh, came back uh, for the same product that they fired us for. Personnel changed, they inadvertently came back years later, but no one came back. We didn't lose money in 2000, we didn't lose money in 2001, and we did not, by the skin of our teeth, lose money in 2002. So by the time the S&P was down 50%, we had had three up years. So that, that made the firm, that drew in the assets. We have a great surge of toxicity. I think we've made our planet unfavorable to life in every form, including homo sapiens. Investors are racing to put their money into climate solutions. By the end of last year, the number of global mutual funds and ETFs focused on climate investing climbed 27% from 2021. Collectively, these 1,200 funds manage more than $400 billion. And in the first quarter of 2023, climate-themed ETFs made up 40% of all newly opened funds. But long before it was trendy, billionaire investor Jeremy Grantham was passionate about addressing the climate crisis. In 1997, he and his wife launched the Grantham Foundation for the Protection of the Environment. Now, Grantham is pledging the bulk of his fortune to the foundation to fight climate change. He calls the effort the race of our lives. And for him, the capital flowing into green investing reflects the warnings he's been making for years. Extreme weather like floods and fires have created momentum for policies like carbon taxes, which will transform global investing. As of now, he seems to be correct. Last year's Inflation Reduction Act included roughly $370 billion of climate incentives. And by the end of 2022, global investment in energy transition top one trillion dollars. What are you most worried about when you wake up every day and look at the stock market and the economy? Well, if you want my the honest answer. Well, I want your honest answers. It's, uh, I, I feel that the economy, and, and particularly the stock market, is very secondary to a, a list of important long-term problems that we have that no one take seriously enough yet. And I feel that when we sit here discussing the stock market, we're a little like Emperor Nero fiddling while, while Rome burns. Um, my, my job description these days at GMO is working on long-term underrated problems. And it's been a wonderful time to be doing that because we have climate change, the most important issue in the investing world for the next few decades, we have shortages of resources, we have shortages of manpower, a population bust the like of which we have never seen, particularly in a few countries like China, with huge significance. We have an incredible growth in inequality, which I think is the poison in the political system. 
and we have a great surge of toxicity. I think we've made our planet unfavorable to life in every form, including Homo sapiens. And these are real issues. They're moving incredibly fast. They threaten the well-being of Homo sapiens. They threaten, perhaps, the existence of a stable global society. So but we, we, uh, <laughs> we, we spend all our time and energy discussing uh, these relatively trivial issues, which I've spent my life studying. And for good or bad, I have spent a lot of effort thinking about the great bubbles. So uh, when you go to a cocktail party or something and people ask you how the world is doing and you tell them it's all falling apart, do, you, do people get tired of hearing this from you? Do you ever tell people, actually, there's something good happening? And what are the good things happening? Do you ever have any of those ideas? You've got to frame it in a, in a more interesting way. And, and fortunately, the reality is that the effort going into climate change, for example, is so impressive. It's moving so fast. It's attracting so many of the really best scientists that uh, you can look back at what people thought would happen to wind, solar, and storage, and EVs. We have done much better than people thought 20 years ago. So we frame it as the race of our lives, that the, the good news is moving faster than we thought. You all know about the bad news because the headlines are dripping with this news for the last two years in particular, fires, death, droughts, food problems, hurricanes, ocean level rise. It's all around us. And, and the press certainly has picked it up. And most people realize that this is a serious issue. Who manages your money? Well, I'm, I'm pleased to say 95% of my money is, is in a foundation. And I, I co-manage the foundation. And we are invested 75% in early stage venture capital, which is most people would consider a, a bizarre uh, concentration. We consider it the best part of capitalism and very much the best part of American capitalism. I think American capitalism is pretty fat and happy, monopolistic, and, and, and not in great, in really great shape. But I think American venture capital industry is the pride and joy of the venture capital world, bigger and better, attracts people from all over the world. So overall, uh, inequality in the United States is a subject that many politicians deal with, social inequality, economic inequality. Do you think the inequality in the United States is increasing, or is it increasing uh, around the world? It's been increasing in, in most developed countries a little bit, but in, in the US particularly fast. When I arrived, the uh, CEO of a Fortune 500 earned 40 times his average worker, which seems like a lot of money. And in Japan, it was about the same. Today, in Japan, it's still 40 or 50 times. And in America, it's over 300 times, which I think is only describable as obscene. And uh, I, I, I think the average hour worked uh, only earns about 10% more than it did in 1975. And that trails way behind the French. It's up 140%. And, I like to say the dopey Brits are up about 60, and we're up somewhere between zero and 10%. The average worker should feel that he has been ripped off, and he has. So let's talk about uh, outside of investing. Um, you are obviously very concerned about climate change, and your foundation is devoted to climate change related things. So what do you do to help climate change? Do you walk a lot? Do you ride bikes? Or what do you do to kind of promote the idea that people should not ruin the environment? Not, not, not enough. I, I figure, uh, but I, I have a Tesla, and, uh, and I feel guilty when I take a jet. Um, but what we do with our money is much more to the point. 50% uh, of our foundation is invested in green technology. And half of that, 25%, we do ourselves. So we have a team of, of about six people. And we've done, we've done about 60 deals uh, directly. It is often thought that uh, there might be a bubble in green investing, because some people say so much money is going into green investing that maybe that's a bubble. Are you worried about that? I am worried about that. But the good news is countries all over the world are finally realizing this is the serious issue. 
they're moving their, their tax structure, they're moving their subsidies, they're moving their research dollars uh, to, to, to green. The IRA in the US, a wonderful example, has really set, set the wheels turning. And uh, the wind is in the sails of, of green investing. The uh, top line revenue growth of green companies, of EVs, will completely dominate the top line revenue growth of the old gasoline powered vehicles, for example. So I'm not too late to get into this. It is very, very early and for at least the next 100 years, uh, climate change will be the dominant investing issue. Well, I'm gonna call you in 100 years and see how it works out. I think of myself as a realist, trying to see the world as it really is and not the way I'd like it to be. And sometimes I succeed and sometimes I fail in that. So let me ask you a few final questions. Um, what is the best investment advice you've ever received? Somebody said, here's what you should do, Jeremy, and you thought it was really good advice. Darn it, I can't, I can't think of, of well, any. Maybe nobody gave you any great advice. Maybe they advice. didn't, maybe that's why I've had to make all the mistakes myself. Okay. What about uh, the worst mistake that investors, aver the average investor makes? You've seen a lot of investors. Is there a common mistake that investors make? They get uh, far too enthusiastic. And uh, I understand that. I, I, I can get pretty enthusiastic about about new deals, new startups when people are presenting them. Um, I, I like to leave those decisions to my colleagues who have better discipline. So I, I understand getting carried away. And I in, invested in that first bubble of 1968 uh, and managed to make a small fortune and lose it. And after that, I became a, a completely diehard value manager. So if I said to you, look, I'm not that wealthy. I have $100,000. I'd like to put it somewhere where I'm not going to lose it. What would you recommend the person? Just a index fund or something else? No, no. I think a, a global index fund that that had um, most of its money outside the U.S. And if if they were up to it, I would say own, only invest outside the U.S. for the time being, because this this overpricing in the market is mainly a U.S. event. The, the markets outside the U.S. are not particularly overpriced. So for a young person today, do you think it's a good idea to go into the money management world today, venture capital, private equity? Do you think that business is too crowded? And what would you recommend to some young person what they should do now? And do you think the money management business is a good business to be in? It's a good business for making money. I think it's inherently trivial, which is a problem we've all had to deal with. <clears throat> and I would say a good combination of trying to make money and be useful is go into, uh, go into the venture capital world. Either run a startup yourself or deal with funding the startups and picking the winners and helping the winners. Uh, and if you could focus on, on the real problems that we somewhat talked about, like, like uh, uh, climate change, then you, you really are combining a chance of making a lot of money with doing some good. So would you call yourself overall an optimist or a pessimist? Pessimist because you're saying the markets are always overvalued and we're going to have problems, or an optimist because you've lived a life where you've seen so many great things happen to you? I think of myself as a realist, trying to see the world as it really is and not the way I'd like it to be. And sometimes I succeed and sometimes I fail in that. But uh, when, when I focus on, on new ventures, I must say, it's irresistible to be optimistic. They can really carry you along.